Now, the toppling of Colonel Gaddafi has been presented as the first step in a transition to a modern democratic state. But one look at the National Transitional Council reveals a glaring fact. They're nearly all men. The Arab Spring was presented as bringing freedom to all. It was noticeable how many of the earlier demonstrators in the centre of Cairo were in Tahrir Square instead of being at home cooking their husband's dinner. The expectation was that the end of autocracy would benefit both sexes. Madeleine Morris reports. Always uh, an incredibly important factor in the sense that people are very discontented. Um, at a place we, I don't think we've ever been ways, where the world is looking at us. In the beginning, it was spring for everyone. Women as well as men on the streets in Egypt, Tunisia, Bahrain, veiled and bareheaded, a democratic and feminist Arab awakening. <laughs> Six months later, notice a difference? <laughs> Libya's revolution is being run almost exclusively by men. It seems that women were at the forefront of the initial protests in Benghazi. Women, I think, have played a strong role in the opposition. We don't see a huge representation of women in the National Transitional Council. It seems clear that women are in a very small minority. <laughs> The irony is, before the revolution, Libya was one of the more equal countries in the Arab world. Women were better educated than in neighbouring countries, had maternity benefits and held high-ranking government positions. Of course, Colonel Gaddafi always had his personal peccadilloes. There was the all-female team of bodyguards. And in his famous green book, a strange lecture on matters gynaecological. There is a natural difference between the man and the woman. This means that there is certainly a different role for each one of them. The woman gets sick every month, and the man does not menstruate because he is male, therefore he doesn't get a disease monthly. But women were always a visible, vital part of the colonel's Libya. Could that be about to change? In Tunisia and Egypt, women not only marched, but were leading the protests. Everyone wants a new start, uh, so uh, you know, it's just, it's just lovely to be part of it all. Well, every, everyone suffered from a different problem, but now we think all our problems are going to be resolved. Yes, we're very optimistic now. But as the dictators fell and the interim government came in, women have slowly seen their contributions swept to one side. In Egypt, for example, there is not one single woman on the committee to rewrite the constitution. It's devastating for some activists. Unfortunately, the, the way that, uh, that the country has been ruled so far uh, did not really allow for strong participation or um, inclusion of women in decision making. We thought that with a, a new democratic Egypt, this would be over. But we still don't see this happening. In Tunisia, women are feeling the backlash too. Back in January, they marched together with men to overthrow President Ben Ali. But now this female Tunisian blogger says boys shout at her in the streets, your place is in the kitchen, why do you need more rights? And some are blaming women, especially the former president's wife, for the excesses of his regime. The big unknown is how much power will land in the hands of the religious movements. A recent poll in Tunisia put their Islamist party in the lead. Egypt's Muslim Brotherhood is still strong, and the Libyan rebels' ranks are swelled by Islamist fighters. In the struggle for a democratic voice as spring passes into summer and autumn, Arab women may find themselves no better off than during the long winter of the dictators. Well, let's chew this over now with Amal Tahouni, who's a political analyst who recently spent five months working with the National Transitional Council in Benghazi and in New York with Mona al a Middle East commentator. Is it really going to be a new dawn in Libya, do you think? All I can say is that I had an extremely positive experience. I just went marching into a city that wasn't mine without any family, and there were women involved in every aspect of the revolution from what I could see although we actually haven't seen much evidence of women on the streets, either um, in Tripoli or in Benghazi. On the contrary, I'd say maybe it wasn't covered in the stories, but it was definitely visibly present. They were leading on marches, they were organizing themselves, they were setting up civil societies, over 100 newspapers were set up, many of which were editorialized by women and 
in every aspect of the revolution, from the local councils to the NTC to the cabinet, so I have dealt with and worked with both men and women to no detriment to myself. Mona al Tahawi, do you share this confidence about the advance of women as a consequence of the Arab Spring? Um, absolutely. I mean, I think the, the revolution that we've seen on the ground, the revolution of the feet, has definitely to be followed by the revolution of the mind. And that's, I think, the key element that all the countries across the region have to face sooner or later. But, and by the revolution of the mind, I mean recognizing that we fought a patriarch in the form of the dictator. And we now need to fight patriarchs within ourselves, within our families, within our work. But having said that, nothing could be worse than what people had lived under, under Gaddafi, under Mubarak, under Ben Ali. I mean, under Gaddafi, you had social rehabilitation centers in which girls and women were basically dumped if they were victims of sexual assault or rape. These all must close. There is no doubt in my mind whatsoever that men and women in Libya will live much better lives without Gaddafi. And this idea, this amusing idea that he was some sort of feminist hero, what do you make of that? That was just outrageous. I mean, remember, he would go to Italy and tell his pal Berlusconi uh, to round up women for him so that he could rescue European women. It was laughable. And, you know, that, that passage we heard from the Green Book and, and this image that he had that he was a feminist because he was surrounded by these female bodyguards, it was just ludicrous. And it was as ludicrous as the first ladies of many of our countries, like Suzanne Mubarak, for example, claiming to champion women's rights when they understood very well that their husbands' regimes are ruining everybody's lives. So that was just absurd. He's not a feminist. What do you make of this characterization of Gaddafi? Uh, uh, I wholeheartedly agree with everything Mon has said. In Libya, the, the problems were never sexism, preventing women from advancing. It was complete nepotism. It affected both men and women. So it was never anyone advancing on the point of merit. It was the point that you didn't have a connection to the regime, and so therefore you were automatically excluded, not because you were a woman. Can you really, in your wildest dreams, imagine any of these countries having a female president? I very much hope in the future. I, there's hope nothing is not stopping quite in me. The, same as imagining. the experience in the past five months, I have been able to walk into the NTC, work with both Mustafa Abdulil and members of the executive cabinet, been taking on foreign ministries. There's nothing that has stopped me except for the fact that I had to come home for a little bit of a break. But absolutely, there is nothing stopping any of the women that I've met. Well, from having a future role in leading their country. There's only one woman on the NTC, isn't there? No, there's more than one woman on the NTC. Um, the entire National Assembly has let to be elected when the council moved to Tripoli. There are women working on the local councils. There's women working on the cabinet. There's certainly women behind civil society uprisings which are taking place throughout the country. And so, while certainly there is a lot of male chess beating going on in a lot of Arab countries, if you look at the women who are actually getting on with the work, they all kind of roll their eyes and you know, step aside the need for any um, particular camera in their face, as opposed to just getting on with the work. And they're very comfortable with the role that they have. Mona Al-Tahabi, can you imagine a female um, president of Egypt? Well, we have a woman running for president in Egypt, Jeremy. Her name is Bouthena Kamal. Yes. She is a very well-known television presenter. Mm. And just before I came on the air, I was following her tweets from southern Egypt. She has tirelessly traveled across the country. She is stumping, stumping and canvassing more than any of the male candidates I've heard of. Whether she stands a chance at becoming our next president or not is besides the point. Which mu what's much more important to me is that she's out there. She's meeting people in the most conservative areas of Egypt. She's going out there and she's saying what every candidate needs to say, male or female. What do you need as an Egyptian? What can we do to make free Egypt succeed? And, you know, I would vote for her. And I hope that in the next presidential, um, uh, uh, next presidential elections we have in Egypt, more than one woman runs. I mean, this is just the beginning. You know, it's only just been seven months since we finally got rid of Mubarak. We need to work on the revolution of the mind. We need to persuade Egyptian women and men that together, as citizens of Egypt, they must rebuild the country. And that's how we end up ensuring that boys and girls, men and women, have equal roles to play in our countries. How long is it going to take? I have no idea, but it took 18 days to get rid of Mubarak. And if it takes <laughs> the rest of our lives to make sure that this kind of equality becomes a reality. I mean, look, you're watching children in Egypt right now seeing a woman run for president. Children in Egypt growing up right now with their parents telling them, remember Tahrir Square, remember the squares in Alexandria, remember across the country. When we marched against Mubarak, you're talking about a generation that is, that is awake, that is saying we got rid of a dictator. That sense of excitement and that sense of optimism is 
is addictive and is absolutely inspirational. So knowing the patriarchy that does exist in our countries, I'm not an apologist for that, but knowing that and knowing that we got rid of the number one patriarch, we can do it, I am sure. Thank you both very much.